What's going on? Oh, yeah. Why it's coming up as a message here. Yeah. Okay, well, hello and good evening, everybody. I'm very glad you've come to our meeting. This is our first meeting after the summer break. Very exciting times in Britain. The Radio 4 was in a state and a half about Liz Truss's budget. <laughs> but we're going to enjoy a little bit of history at a, also a very important time that Francis Bingham is going to talk to us about. And a little bit of history will have it will be involving Valentine Auckland, who was a communist in the 30s. And um, it's my my role to introduce Frances because she's going to talk about uh, Valentine Ackland and is going to show us also some pictures so there'll be a little bit of a show going on. Frances, I, I'm going to read this because I didn't know you before Frances but now I know you. Frances is a London-based freelance writer who works across the literary spectrum. I mean, you, you've done work, obviously I looked you up on the internet, you've done work in all the different fields. You've done poetry books, you've done um, plays, you've done, um, well, non-fiction, uh, you've done the principle of camouflage, I read. That's yes. one of the things you've done. So I've been very, very active in all the fields. And actually, I read this year, I read Virginia Woolf, A Room of My Own. Fabulous. And it is just absolutely stunning. And she says, right, right, right. Because we haven't, women haven't got a past to look back on. Because everybody quotes their Cicero and their Ovid and their whatnot. And of course, we haven't. Because women haven't really been permitted to participate in the culture activity. And so it's a wonderful thing that you're here this evening to tell us about uh, Valentine Auckland. Uh, other things you've done, you're focusing on uh, gender transgressive lives, as well as editing journey from winter selected poems, uh, the Valentine Auckland uh, biography, uh, transgressive lives, which, which has been published. Um, the Principle of Camouflage, The Blue Hour of Natalie Barney, which was produced at the Arcola Theatre London. So I welcome you, Francis, to this evening talk. I'm very excited to hear all about uh, what you have to say to us and the pictures you're going to show. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. I'll just attempt to do my share screen now so that you can show you the photos. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Brilliant. Excellent. I hope that's now showing on your mm -hmm. screens. Brilliant. This is the cover image of my biography, Valentine Ackland, A Transgressive Life. It's a portrait detail of Valentine in the late 1920s by Eric Gill which exploits her fashionable androgyny, contrasting the masculine looking eaten cropped head we see here with the naked female body of the entire drawing. This is a very queer image, I think. Valentine records that as a child, people commented that she was a very queer girl, really, spelt Q-U-A-I-R. And by the time she wrote that, Valentine was probably aware of the sense in which the word meant not only an outsider, but specifically a sexual outsider, a transgressor against societal norms. And she thought it was amusing that her queerness had been talked about even then. Valentine Ackland is best known today as the lover of the remarkable writer, Sylvia Townsend Warner as a poet in her own right, and as a gender rebel who identified herself as a lesbian with a capital L and habitually cross-dressed. But during her lifetime, she was also notorious as a communist. For much of her life, she was under surveillance by MI5 and her sexual as well as political deviance was under investigation as there was a perceived link between the two kinds 
of dangerous nonconformism. The next photo, which isn't, working which isn't coming moment. up at the moment. Mm. Oh, can we do that? Here we go. I'll, I'll come and sit by you, sorry. Okay, thank you. This photo that's now appeared is a blurred 1930s selfie taken in the mirror and it shows the two women together Sylvia looking at Valentine who's holding the box camera it's a characteristic image showing their difference in height Valentine was six feet tall and dress Valentine in contemporary men's clothes and their intimacy this gives us a glimpse of the young politically passionate Valentine always remembered by Sylvia standing on the pavement in Pall Mall, holding up her fist clenched in the communist salute as the Arms for Spain demo went by. Valentine came from a relatively privileged background, but a troubled childhood left her resistant to traditional gender roles and open to revolutionary ideas. Born in 1906, she was the second child of wealthy parents whose London house was in Mayfair, opposite Claridge's Hotel. They also owned a large holiday home at Winterton on the Norfolk coast. Here's the family in their car with five-year-old Valentine, then called Molly, at the wheel <laughs> with her older sister and her mother and her father standing outside it with the nanny she labelled on the back of the picture, my awful nurse. <laughs> Valentine's mother, Ruth, was of Scots descent with various titled Edinburgh judges in her ancestry, while her father, Robert, was the senior dental surgeon at Bart's Hospital, where he was a pioneer of facial plastic surgery during the First World War. There were no Ackland sons. Valentine's sister, Joan, was eight years older and abused and bullied her mercilessly, causing lasting psychological damage. Joan was a hard, hard scourge on the back of a child, Valentine wrote later. I bear the mark still and I always shall. Valentine was also neglected by her parents who entrusted her to this tyrannical nanny who terrified the child and often left her hungry or cold. These experiences gave Valentine a lifelong empathy with the helpless and suffering. And when she talked about the hardships of poverty, she'd actually paradoxically experienced some of them. Although Valentine was given a typically limited girls education at a private school in London, she was allowed an unusual amount of freedom on holiday in Norfolk, where she learnt to drive, shoot and box, as well as the less gendered pursuits of riding, swimming and fishing. Here, she wrote, the London child became a privately adventurous, ageless and sexless being. But she was known locally as the young master or his lordship because of a resemblance to her father, which amused him. This is Valentine, dressed for riding, aged nine, which gives an idea of what they meant. Booted and suited in child's riding gear, she looks, as she described herself, in her boyhood. Her other solace was in reading and believing that she might be a poet one day. These childish daydreams did not take into account that as a woman of her class, she was destined to be a debutante and make a suitable marriage. Shows Valentine as a Deb, already a striking young woman. She had apparently no idea then that her father's favor, such as it was, was absolutely conditional on her acceptable behavior. At finishing school in Paris, 
aged 15. She began an affair with another girl, Lana. And as she wrote later, that less than month in the spring of 1922 controlled the whole course of my life. The young Valentine discovered her sexual identity all at once. She wrote, when I lay down in love, I was instantly released into my own whole self. I knew that I possessed myself as well as because of possessing her. When her father found out about the affair, after her sister stole their love letters and showed them to him, he told Valentine that she had committed the worst, filthiest, most unforgivable thing that anyone could do. While she insisted that there was nothing sinful or unnatural about falling in love. It was the first time she'd ever defied her father, but as she wrote of her courage afterwards, he did not know that I had the poets to protect me. Robert never spoke to his daughter again. When he died a year later, they were still unreconciled and during his last illness, he refused to see her. Valentine wrote later that he'd never forgiven her, that he died not loving, but hating me, and that what he hated was an essential part of me. It's perhaps not surprising that after her father's death, Valentine tried to conform to traditional expectations and take the time-honoured way of escaping family control by marrying, despite being committed to a serious affair with the woman, Bo Foster. This is Bo, 10 years older than Valentine, a sociable, cheerful woman who converted her to Catholicism and briefly to volunteering with the young conservatives. The other person is Richard Turpin, who was briefly her husband and also became Catholic, equally briefly. Predictably, this heterosexual interlude was a disaster. The marriage lasted less than six months and ended in annulment. Richard also had a lover, another man, and hoped that marriage would cure him, but he'd chosen very much the wrong wife to help with such a project. Valentine said she was physically revolted by him and desperately fought against his insistence on his rights as master of everything, of me. Eventually, she underwent an operation to remove her hymen, which was supposed to be particularly tough, the problem which had kept the marriage unconsummated. This was another savage punishment for non-compliance. The sexual incompatibility of the couple was presented as her fault. And this medical intervention was intended to force her into obedience and gender appropriate behavior. In fact, it decided her to leave her husband. And while convalescing from the operation in 1925, she visited the Dorset village of Cholden for the first time, wearing trousers, which she claimed were unheard of then except among perverts. After this, Valentine took to dressing in male clothes. She usually wore trousers, often with a man's shirt and tie. This was intended to be a proclamation of an openly lesbian sexual identity. Valentine wrote that she wished lesbians could wear a distinctive dress as men do. And if the binary system of gender coded clothing was inadequate for her needs, she did her best with it. Valentine's trousers proclaimed herself her father's true heir, while simultaneously revealing herself in the sexual role which had made him disown her. Trousers also signified the sexual potency her husband had lacked, as well as the gentlemanliness he'd failed to show towards her. As a sartorial choice, trousers indicated that she had usurped certain masculine privileges, particularly from these two men, husband and father, who had shown themselves incapable and undeserving. In a more obvious way, trousers were pleasurably shocking, an announcement that she was not a conventional woman and did not intend to be bound 
by social expectations. They were also a shorthand for being like men in possessing the power to be a lover of women. And to advertise this was both an act of bravado and a satirical gesture. Performing certain aspects of masculinity enabled her to enjoy attributes usually forbidden to women then, without the disadvantages of actual maleness. As she'd married at 19, Valentine was still very young when her marriage was annulled, but her status as a married if divorced woman, ironically, allowed her the independence to live away from the family home, dress as she liked, experiment with her sexuality, and begin to create a new identity. During the late 1920s, Valentine lived alone in a studio in Bloomsbury. Her poetry was published in magazines. She modeled for artists like Augustus John and Eric Gill. And she had affairs with rebel socialite Nancy Cunard, the film star Anna Mae Wong, and the gallery owner Dorothy Warren, among many others, although she was still involved with Bo. She also often stayed in Cholden, where she wrote poetry and joined a local community of writers. This Dorset village, Valentine said, was an extraordinary place. Extraordinary things happened there and extraordinary people were to be found there and like communism, according to his need. And this photo gives some idea of its beauty hidden in a fold of the downs. But here, Valentine also saw the reality of rural poverty at close quarters. She witnessed the hard lives of shepherds and farmhands and was shocked by the tumble down estate cottages, which the landlord wouldn't repair. Her particular friends among the villagers were an elderly countrywoman known as Granny Moxon, who was reputed to be a witch, the pub landlady, Florrie Legg, who was tactful about Valentine's heavy drinking, and the bus driver, Mr Gould, who allowed her to take the wheel, resulting in high-speed travel along Dorset lanes. There was a local rumour that Valentine was really a young man, which she did nothing to discourage. As she was so tall, with her cropped hair, Valentine could pass as a man easily, and often did so, although she didn't seek to. Once, when she was at a tea party in the village of Chaldon, hosted by the writer Theodore Powis, another visitor indicated her and asked, is this your eldest son, Mr Powis? Theodore only mumbled, no, and nobody enlightened the guest any further. It was at a Powis tea in 1927 that Valentine first encountered Sylvia Townsend Warner. Sylvia was 12 years older, already an established author and a modern chic woman of wit, sophistication and unnerving intellect. This photo shows her a little later, fording the river outside their house in Froomvale Church in the 1940s. The most characteristic image of Sylvia, not looking so poised as the Cecil Beaton or Howard Costa author photos, but so vigorous and idiosyncratic with her skirts hitched up and a cigarette hanging out of her mouth. Sylvia's background was also unusual. She was an only child of great gifts, whose father, George, was a much loved housemaster at Harrow School where she'd been brought up. But this place in the heart of the establishment was equivocal in that as a girl, Sylvia was excluded from formal education there. Her famous erudition was acquired piecemeal from her father and her mother, Nora, who was a brilliant but difficult woman. There wasn't the same level of wealth as in the Ackland family. After her father's death, when she was 22, Sylvia earned her own living as a musicologist, researching for the huge edition of Tudor church music, which was being compiled through the 1920s. Living independently in London with many friends, Sylvia developed an extraordinary level of self-sufficiency, a wry humour, and a radical desire to disrupt conventional society. This was demonstrated in her first novel, the runaway bestseller, Lolly Willows. 
She first came to Chaldon, by then known as Bloomsbury on Sea, with a lover, the sculptor Stephen Tomlin, who was making her unhappy. And she'd also had an inescapable married man relationship since the age of 19 with the teacher friend of her father's who'd given her piano lessons at Harrow. But like Valentine, Sylvia loved Chaldon with its beautiful downs and long views. She made friends with Theodore Poes and his circle, stayed in the village often, and heard of an elusive young poet called Valentine Ackland. Valentine was invited to come to tea and meet a poet because the poet knew she admired Sylvia's work. But on that occasion, she did not enjoy Sylvia's forceful personality and tornado of talk. Sylvia, in turn, was startled by Valentine's Paris scent, dashing looks and disapproving silence. It wasn't evidently a great success. But despite this unpromising start, poetry gradually brought them together. Sylvia read and admired Valentine's poetry and also her legs, she later admitted. By 1930, their mutual admiration had become flirtatious. Sylvia wooed Valentine with compliments and cookery. Valentine responded with poems about reading Sylvia's work. I was aware of your words, my heart intent, a stir to them, my heart was a quickened lover. She also promised to look after Sylvia's new cottage in Chaldon as a steward while she was away in London. Before Sylvia left for the winter, they shared the cottage for a week in separate bedrooms while their careful courtship advanced no further. But one windy night with the owls hooting and the inside creaking outside, Valentine told Sylvia that she felt utterly loveless. It was the cue Sylvia needed. She took Valentine in her arms and told her how much she was loved. So they at last became lovers and Valentine wrote, I did not know that such joy could be found or ever beguiled to stay. Less than three months later in London, they exchanged wedding rings the morning after hearing a Mozart concert at which Sylvia had told Valentine, I looked at all those people and I only wanted you, which Valentine took as she intended as a romantic declaration of permanent and absolute commitment. This love inspired poetry. And in 1934, Valentine and Sylvia's joint poetry book, Whether a Dove or Seagull, was published by Chatham and Windus. They both continued to write love poems, as well as many other kinds, leaving a unique account of their long relationship, which endured, despite many upheavals, for the rest of their lives. This is the first verse of a poem from 1965, called A Not Poem About Love, a meditation on love in age, which Valentine wrote only a few years before her death. I kneel at your feet, I kiss your hands, I am your lover. I love you more than water, more than I love the swans cruising along the river beside our house, more than I love the summers, the abundant years. Living in Chaldon during the early 1930s, both Valentine and Sylvia were painfully aware of the effects of the depression, the extreme poverty of the rural workers who were their neighbors, and especially of the women who struggled to keep families fed and shod and warm without adequate housing. Valentine was appalled by the land workers' dependence on the local land owners. In the Norfolk village of her childhood, Winterton, fishing was the main source of income. So although the people had a hard and sometimes dangerous job, they weren't tied to the estate and the work their masters might provide or withhold. Valentine wrote a series of articles for the Daily Worker, which exposed these problems and demanded action. This was published by Lawrence and Wishart 
1936 as a book, Country Conditions, a serious work of, inve of investigative journalism, which caused satisfactory outrage among the landowners, but little genuine change. By then, Valentine had already joined the Communist Party in the vanguard of the swing to the left, among so many of the British intelligentsia of her generation, who saw communism as the only active alternative to the rise of fascism. As Sylvia later observed, at that date, for anybody of intelligence, that was the only way to go. Sylvia always gave Valentine the credit for their embrace of communism, which is probably accurate in the political sense. But Sylvia had always been a revolutionary in her own way. She was a lifelong disruptor of social norms. She said of her scandalous relationship with Valentine, it is so natural to be hunted and intuitive. Feeling safe and respectable is so much more of a strain. To Valentine, communism was an idealistic creed, which seemed to have infinite potential for changing existing oppressive systems of all kinds. Just as she'd always written a poem when a sentence of death was carried out in Dorchester jail as a protest against capital punishment and a statement of witness. So now she began to write poems which expressed her awareness that the country was being despoiled and its workers exploited, that radical change was long overdue. And she wanted to be a hero, if not a martyr, to the cause. MI5 was alerted to these new converts early in 1935, when Valentine offered her MG sports car, which she drove, according to Sylvia, like God, for use on Communist Party business. MI5 routinely intercepted her letter to CPHQ and presumed from the name and car that she was a man. After much confusion, including the mistaken impression that Townsend and Warner were two different people, the hilariously inept investigation revealed that Sylvia was one person and Valentine was a woman. <laughs> the next question was whether either of the two suspects engaged in subversive activities of any kind or appears to be in any way abnormal. This latter inquiry was presumably prompted by the fact that they were two women living together and that one of them had been mistaken for a man. These suspicions were confirmed by a report which detailed Valentine's small racing car, her rifle for shooting rabbits, and the fact that she, more often than not, wears male clothing in preference to female attire while Sylvia appears normal in habits. There was in fact no other evidence of subversive activity. Their intercepted post revealed nothing more suspicious than poetry magazines, gardening catalogues, bills, parcels from bookshops, and enormous supplies of coffee and cigarettes. But like many of their left-wing contemporaries in the cultural world, W.H. Alden, Nancy Cunard, Christopher Isherwood, C. Day Lewis, George Orwell, J.B. Priestley, Paul Robeson, Stephen Spender, and many others. They were under suspicion as much for their personalities as for their politics. The Secret Service evidently had deep doubts of writers and artists, especially women, as well as sexual or gender transgressives of any kind. Those from a privileged background were considered doubly treacherous. The reports on Valentine and Sylvia make much of the fact that the two literary ladies are close companions and as a class identifier, have some independent means. As communists, they had tried to give up their class distinctions and privileges, living simply, doing without servants. And they were already to some extent declassed by their choice to live as lesbians, artists, political radicals and workers. However, they were intellectuals classified by the party as bourgeois and they had retained ineradicable class signifiers 
such as their grand accents, dress and manner, and high cultural style. Valentine once wrote to the Daily Worker, pointing out that they were supposedly trying to create a class-less society rather than perpetuate the existing system by constantly assessing other comrades' backgrounds. More seriously, Valentine was writing new revolutionary poetry, like her long communist poem, 1935, which ends with the lines, with light and heart, watch life swing round, complete the revolution. Sylvia's novels of the period, Summer Will Show, and After the Death of Don Juan, are also in her own particular style, Marxist works. In Cholden, they entertained comrades, such as the poet Edgel Rickward, Queenie and Julius Lipton, the publishers, and the Quaker Stephen Clark, seen here with Sylvia reading The Daily Worker, Julius holding a spaniel Towser, among many others. So many, indeed, that Sylvia complained their house should be renamed the Oldie Communist Dresty. Mm -hmm. Their work for the party also included selling the Daily Worker in Dorchester, loaning out books from the Left Book Club, organising Republican alternatives to royal celebrations, and attempting to recruit their neighbours to the cause with mixed results. It also took them to Wales during the miners' strike, to many anti-fascist concerts and Albert Hall meetings where they spoke, and to an unpleasantly close encounter with a police baton charge at a march in Whitechapel. But the great cause for the left was now the anti-fascist war in Spain. Valentine enthusiastically collected for the Soap for Spain Fund, wrote passionate poems and contributed this characteristic answer to the famous left review pamphlet, Authors Take Sides on the Spanish Civil War. Fascism is symptomatic of the sick man's will to self-destruction. Artists live to resist this will. They express the fight of the living people for life against death. I stand with the people and government of Spain, against fascism always, against confused thinking and cowardice, for the artist's most important qualities of reason and tenacious strength. Valentine hoped to volunteer as a combatant in Spain when early in the war there were female fighters, Miliciana, like the British artist Felicia Brown, who died in action in 1936, killed in defense of democracy, as the newspaper report said. This belligerent ambition proved impossible, but with the help of their fighting comrade, Tom Wintringham, Valentine and Sylvia were able to volunteer for British medical aid attached to the Red Cross in Barcelona, where Valentine had to be content with ambulance driving and more mundane tasks, not without their dangers. There, they observed a revolutionary new world in action on the streets. Clothes no longer demarcated the different classes. Everyone was hatless. Waiters addressed their customers informally. And best of all, women could walk where they pleased. The atmosphere was carnivalesque, yet intensely serious, vibrant with energy and suppressed violence. It was frighteningly chaotic. Many of the bomb shattered buildings were collapsing and the streets barricaded. It was also very crowded. It was said that over a million refugees had fled to the city. And Valentine reported, it looked true. This photo shows them in Spain with their comrade Asuncion. Valentine's Red Cross armband is just visible and they're all wearing party badges. Valentine smoking a cigar. And I was told by someone who knew her that the hand on forehead gesture shading her eyes was very characteristic. Something of Valentine's idealism is captured by Sylvia's memory of her impetuous chivalry. Her most glorious days, our highest demonstration of love spreading out to our fellows. And she called it 
the proudest time of my life. Back home in Dorset, Ballantyne remained deeply involved with the struggle in Spain, as this short atmospheric poem expresses. A hundred men who came the road with me, homeward to England, out of fighting Spain, come in mind only, few of them will see, as I the autumn and the winter rain. Comrades who stayed behind will know a different rain from heaven. Across the mountains weighed with snow, deadly, the storms are driven. Valentine continued her usual task of party fundraising and also volunteered to work with traumatised baggage in Tain, where she supported her charges with cigarettes and football. It seemed that Valentine might reach Spain again when she was commissioned by the party to lead a lorry convoy carrying aid and important documents over the snowy Pyrenees. Sylvia was forbidden to go too, and she was frantic with worry about the dangerous and illegal journey. At the last minute, they were reprieved when Valentine fell ill on the eve of departure and her adventure was called off. But in 1937, they were both invited back to Spain as British delegates to the Writers' International Congress for the Defence of Culture. Since the itinerary included visits to cities in the war zone and the front line, acceptance levels were not high, but of course they went. Other delegates included Langston Hughes, André Malraux, Pablo Neruda, Octavio Paz and Ludwig Gren. They visited besieged Madrid under bombardment, toured the front lines and experienced Luftwaffe bombing raids, thus becoming early witnesses of a new kind of warfare in which civilians were directly targeted with devastating results. In this context, both were deeply moved by the greeting, Viva los intellectuales, with which they were hailed wherever they went. As Sylvia dryly observed, a strange sentiment to English ears. But even here, there was a level of prejudice against them, both as women and particularly as a lesbian couple. Stephen Spender, who was a fellow anti-fascist delegate, caricatured Valentine in his memoirs as the poetess, addressing her lady novelist companion as comrade darling, being humorless and superior, apparently completely oblivious of his own prejudices. This attitude was widespread to judge by Spender's confidence in the success of his satire, but its presumptions are undermined by both writers' amusing, though serious, and relatively unpatronising accounts of their time in Spain. In one of her war reports for the Daily Worker, Valentine wrote, whatever wild stories are told me of these people's courage, I shall believe them always. It's easy to see they are true. As World War approached, Valentine was aware that the Nazis were exterminating others like me. She knew that the poet Lorca had been murdered in Spain because he was homosexual, as well as for his communist politics. And she was afraid that in Britain, the war would bring tyrannical insistence upon absolute obedience and conformity a descent yet again into darkness. The prospect of enforced conformity was a frightening one for somebody so visibly non-conformist, but not as terrifying as that of a Nazi victory. So Valentine and Sylvia's war effort was sincere for personal as well as patriotic reasons. They volunteered as night fire watchers, walking the lanes and making owl calls on their whistles after practicing the fire alarm very quietly in the lavatory. As van driver and navigator, they delivered chocolate and cigarettes to soldiers in remote postings along the Dorset coast. They also enrolled in an unofficial women's home guard with rifle practice in the orchard. And in 1941, they had the curious experience when Russia became an ally, of hearing the Internationale played after the national anthem at the cinema in Dorchester 
while the audience stood respectfully to attention. Nevertheless, the MI5 investigation continued throughout the war. Valentine was barred from official war work, except for routine clerical jobs, and her employers at the Territorial Army HQ in Dorchester were warned of her communist sympathies. When she moved to the Civil Defence Office, MI5 again intervened, insisting that she is not a suitable person to be employed on highly confidential work. She was in effect blacklisted, as was Sylvia. Although interestingly, MI5's objections to Sylvia lecturing to the troops, as though she might start a mutiny, were overruled. When Valentine discovered that the mysterious codes she'd been set to type out were in fact knitting patterns, she was able to laugh at herself, but this was a bizarre use for her skills. Her sister Joan, photographed here in uniform during the war, had a high ranking job with the Red Cross and was awarded the MBE for her war work. The irony of this can't have helped Valentine in her wartime struggle with alcoholism, which she recounts in the published memoir for Sylvia, a guilt-ridden confession of unhappy addictions. When the war finally ended, Valentine and Sylvia, along with the rest of the population, had suffered in terms of both physical and mental health. Their endurance had been tested, as well as incendiary bomb damage to their new house by the river at Froome Vow Church, shown in this photo. They'd lost the Cholden Cottage to bombing and Valentine's childhood home in Norfolk to army requisitioning, but they'd survived. After the war, although both writers continued to be politically active, their focus changed. Valentine gradually lost sympathy with Stalinist communism, although she remained a staunch anti-fascist, while Sylvia retained her loyalty to the party at the cost of closing her eyes to the true nature of the Soviet dictatorship, a division of opinion which greatly distressed them both but they continued to be active in the pursuit of social justice and the defense of human rights, writing to political prisoners in Greece during the colonel's dictatorship or protesting against nuclear proliferation. As early anti-nuclear activists, they were not only CND supporters, but also campaigners against the building of a new atomic research station at Winfrith near Cholden. A nuclear reactor was sited there in 1956, despite their efforts. Valentine's role as peace campaigner and defender of the environment and a speaker on behalf of the silenced is strongly demonstrated in her poetry of the time with titles such as Before Armageddon, On All the Innocent Lives I Cried in the Night. How did they bury them all? who died in the war? Or do you ever look over and see the refugees? One from 1952, for all that takes place under this dome of sky, contains these lines about human impact on the natural world, which seem extraordinarily relevant today. Heavy with guilt and the weight of woe, standing waist deep already in the rising flood. We keep our eyes closed, our minds blank, not to know what black deed we do. And may we so win some kind of forgiveness, some shabby salvation. Their campaigning record did nothing to change Valentine and Sylvia's dangerous reputation with the authorities and post-war, they continued to be under surveillance. In 1952, the head of MI5 requested another report on these two women who in the past have been of particular interest to us. The report was duly made, observing the suspicious fact that both persons are great readers and possess some literature appertaining to socialism. Despite having no worse evidence of subversive activities 
the file on Valentine was still open when she died in 1969, although she'd long ceased to be a member of the Communist Party. This long running persecution had obviously had an impact on her official reputation, her employment prospects, and of course, her privacy and personal freedom. It was a surreal situation in which reading, writing, any kind of left-wing sympathy, an abnormality, which included sexual difference and gender nonconformism under one convenient label, were all treated as genuinely serious threats to national security. Yet in one sense, the two forms of radicalism had indeed informed one another. Valentine's personal experience as an outsider led her to question the established order of society and to link her own liberation from gender norms with a wider revolution. The alternative relationship which she and Sylvia invented in their life together was an experiment in its way as new as any of the wider social reforms which they espoused. Perhaps the secret services were not so far wrong in believing that once a woman began to express her nonconformist identity openly and live without societal approval, there was no knowing where such disruptive policies might lead. Anarchy, revolution, a new world order. Valentine and Sylvia stayed together living their quietly alternative life at Froomvow Church through the 1950s and 60s. Their relationship survived Valentine's reconversion to Catholicism, of which Sylvia violently disapproved, and the depressions, which Valentine experienced increasingly as she grew older, despite having conquered her alcoholism, and Valentine's multiple infidelities. Shortly before Valentine's death in 1969, she became a Quaker and wrote some remarkable late poems illuminating her spiritual quest. Sylvia died in 1978 and they're buried together in Chaldon Churchyard with a grave marker which reads non omnis moria. I shall not altogether die. This Horatian Latin tag works for them both on so many levels, not least the legacy of work they both left, writing which memorializes their political commitment and radical lives. As a queer witness to the 20th century, throughout her life, Valentine had engaged with the political issues of her time, writing first revolutionary poetry, then prescient laments for the destruction of the natural world as well as the plight of refugees or political prisoners in protests against Vietnam or any of the other wars. Her love poems are also political statements in that they claim the right to speak as a lover of women, transgressing gender conventions and voicing a gender identity, which was in her time just as subversive as membership of the British Communist Party, perhaps worse. This photo shows the cover of my edition of Valentine's Poems, Journey from Winter, with the painting the cover image was taken from, Space Water, by my partner, the lettering artist, Liz Matthews. I'm gonna end by reading another of Valentine's poems, very typically addressing the reader directly, which is included in this book. When you look at me after I have died and note the tidy hair, the sleeping head, closed eyes and quiet hands, do not decide too readily that I was so. Instead, look at your own heart while you may and see how wild and strange a live man is. And so remember me. Good. Now I shall try and stop my screen share. Shall I see if I yes, can find please. The technology. Liz is going to do it for me. That's brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Francis. It was a fascinating journey you've given us. 
And I, I have to admit, I haven't known about Valentin Auckland, but how much she contributed, you've just showed us, that is really wonderful. And I, I have to say again, we it's wonderful to have poetry and poets in the Socialist History Society because history can't just be written, you know, by people who write about wars and fightings and all this sort of thing, but poetry is part of life. And so I think it's wonderful that you've made that contribution. Thank you very much. Thanks. We are going to have uh, questions. We, we have question and answer time now. So anybody who would like to ask a question, I was wondering, actually, I was thinking you, you mentioned a lot of names and uh, you mentioned uh, Garcia Lorca, the poet. Was she there? At, uh, did she actually meet up with him, Francis? I don't think that they actually met Lorca, no. I think they were never in the same part of Spain at the same time, mm -hmm. um, yeah. which is rather ironical because they were, um, they were very excited by Lorca's poetry and quite a lot of the poems that both Sylvia and Valentine wrote were kind of based on um, Spanish poetry of the mm. kind that he was trying to write, um, mm. of that populist folk song related kind of thing. Um, but no, I don't think I ever did meet him, sadly. Mm. Thank you very much. Well, so we have, um, let me see if you can put up your hand and I see Brian Dempsey here, but we have Brian first. You can also write little messages and we can pick you up from there. So shall we have Brian and your question? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I hope um, you can hear me um, reasonably well. Thank you very much. Um, fascinating, really interesting, great to celebrate that. So great to have lesbian lives um, and queer lives recorded and, and, and celebrated. It's fantastic. I was thinking particularly about the communist CPGV um, connection. We've had a few hints recently of people who were involved with the CPGV in the 30s being critical of the Stalinist um, recriminalization of homosexuality in the Soviet Union, particularly male homosexuality, but all, you know, that, that whole reaction during the 1930s. So we've had a few people, I don't know if you, well, obviously, Andre Gide being famous, Harry White, a, a few other Communist Party members were critical in the 30s. So I just wondered whether Ackland was critical, but also more generally, did she have any engagement with the sexology movement, you know, the, the British Societies yes. of Sexual Studies yes. or whatever it was? Yes, yes. Um, interesting. There's sort of two sides to your question. So I'll start off with the last bit about the, the sexologist. Um, she and Sylvia in their library had all of those um, books that were so influential then, Havelock Ellis and so on. Um, and also slightly earlier ones, um, when she was very young, Valentine was very influenced by Edward Carpenter. Um, and that I think that partly influenced her kind of vision of communism, very idealistic. Um, and, you know, the brotherhood of everybody in that. Um, and during the war, they were told that there was a possibility that their house in Froome Vow Church by the river, in the event of, in the event of an invasion, that their house would be um, taken over by the army and used as a, a machine gun post because it was by the river. So it was going to defend the, the bridge to stop the invaders crossing. And so certain um, very special things they sent away from their house to be kept. And among those things was this library of books about the sexologists' um, ideas about homosexuality um, but having said that, although I think they were very strongly influenced by them, at the same time, they were also always able to, at the same time, laugh at these ideas in some ways, which influenced them a lot. There was, a, especially Sylvia, there was always a, a mischievous side to her. Um, so they would write to each other um, a lot 
especially when they first got together, discussing their sexuality, what it meant, um, and often quoting um, rather satirically from some of the things that Havelock Ellis and so on had said about, you know, what it means, um, what an invert is, and so on. So there was sort of two sides to it all. But as far as um, the being aware of the problems for gay people um, in Russia or uh, in the Soviet Union, I don't think that Valentine was aware of that as far as I know. Um, she was very, very anxious to toe the line. She always did things very, very thoroughly. So when she first became interested in communism, she read all of the background stuff in a way that I, I think a lot of people may well have, have not been so well up on the theory of it all as she was, you know, she took it all very, very seriously. In the same way, when she became Catholic, um, you know, nobody knew more about Catholicism than she did. She was, you know, the world expert on it. Um, but I don't think that she knew. I think she was aware of the, of the Nazi persecution of people like me as she put it, and she was aware of obviously what had happened to Lorca. Um, one of the things that uh, I've always found most distressing really about the murder of Lorca is that um, the poet Roy Campbell, who was a supporter of General Franco in Spain, um, wrote a book about his experiences in Spain called Flowering Rifle. And in that book, he spoke of the murder of Lorca. And he said, um, when the fascist troops went into Granada, they rounded up all um, decadent sexual perverts and abusers of children or something horrible and executed them, a normal reaction. And that has always sent a chill through me um, that, you know, he could actually write that and it could be published and he could be, be proud of supporting that massacre. Mm. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francis. I have a little text message here from Eleanor Kerles. Um, and Eleanor is saying, thank you for that wonderful talk. I wonder if you could say anything about Auckland's uh, relationship as an, um, with feminism as an unconventional, highly political woman who was most active after the decline of the suffrage movement, but before the start of the second wave. Yes, that is a very interesting question indeed. Mm. Um, I think that Valentine, was very much a feminist. And Sylvia Townsend Warner certainly was. Um, I expect you're aware that Sylvia's first book, Lolly Willows, um, is a kind of a uh, feminist tract, you know. Um, the And the witchcraft, which is the way in which the heroine um, escapes convention, um, is 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 the, the source of women's power, which mm. both Sylvia and Valentine were always very interested in and involved in. I think Valentine's um, relationship with it was slightly complicated by the fact that, as you say, she had she was an unconventional woman, and she'd taken on what were perceived as masculine qualities of various kinds. Um, so I think that she had an interesting kind of double thing going on that she that that although that she associated herself as um, a, a male kind of woman, at the same time, she was a very feminist woman. Um, and I mean, I think this is interesting to think that, this, that these are questions which are actually playing out nowadays. Um, very strongly and also relate to how people identify um you know as trans as butch as lesbian feminist as lesbian separatist and that kind of thing um they didn't have as many labels then 
Mm -hmm. uh, but Valentine called herself a lesbian. Um, and she wrote that not only in her, in her journals, but also in, in poems. Um, and, um, but interestingly, sorry, it's a slight loop of what we're talking about, but interestingly, um, in Sylvia's terminology, she seemed to think of Valentine as a lesbian, but not of herself as a lesbian. Mm -hmm. um, although obviously she was by in the, what we would term in that she was in a relationship with the woman. Um, so interesting, but they, I think that Valentine's, um, Actually, did you want a cup of tea? Um, Valentine's frequent infidelities to Sylvia, um, I think were a, a weird kind of revenge on, on men. Um, I think that she, um, uh, it may sound like a strange kind of feminism, but I think that, um, that her kind of impersonation of masculinity was an extended um, joke in one way, uh, but also a statement that she could do it better, although she was a woman. And I think that that was um, partly a, a, a weird kind of feminism in that, um, in that she believed that women were enormously superior to men. Yeah, it's it's a very tricky one, isn't it? Because it's you, complicated. It's well, complicated. it's complicated. I mean, I'm just thinking what what it made me think there. I mean, it's in, so complicated; it's very difficult to really grasp the whole complexity of it. I'm thinking, if you are a poet, do you call yourself as a woman poet, a poetess, or a poet? And is that that issue? What what? Where do you belong? Because you know, with everybody who writes, and, and I write poetry as well, you you don't want to group yourself. I mean, say, I mean, good example is BBC Woman's Hour. You don't really, I personally certainly don't think I want to group myself in a separate little bubble and be locked away there. You know, you want to be part of, I want to be part of all the poets. So I would prefer to call myself a poet rather than a poetess. But it's, it's enormously tricky. And, and you know, obviously, Valentine, I, I, the way you describe her seems to me, she, she had a huge sense of her own, as, as she, you said at the beginning, I think that was wonderful. Her first sexual experience was so powerful. She found herself in it and she developed this huge sense of this is me. And, and I want to live my me, I want to live the me. Uh, and so you're not immediately thinking of what all the other women are doing and, and so on. So I, I can see that, but it, it remains complicated. Well, thank you very much for that. Who would like to ask, are there other people who would like to ask a question or make a contribution? I'm looking for any hands up and... Um, David Morgan wants to say something. Oh, David Morgan. Never saw you. Oh, oh, you've got a nice image there of a hand up. <laughs> you have to unmute yourself. Well, I yes. think people, sh people, if they do want to ask a question, should should click on and put their hands up. I mean, I don't, I don't know if everyone knows that. They should know by now. Anyway, uh, yes. Uh, am I unmuted? Uh, I am. Yes, I yeah. do you. Uh, can I continue this debate on, can I use the term cross-dressing without offending anyone? Uh, I think that's a simpler shorthand way of putting it. <laughs> I want I want to know if, I think it's ironic that to, to make a statement affirming herself as a woman, she has to dress a, as a man. I'm not saying that as a criticism, I just think it can be seen as ironic. Uh, but the question I want to ask is, how much was she aware of the tradition of women, feminists especially, and literary women, taking on male attire? Because it obviously gives them, gives them more freedom to manoeuvre, to move about and break social conventions. For example, Wollstonecraft, uh, Colette, I think Colette came in the 30s, didn't mm. she? Uh, Georges Sand, 
obviously these are French, but I mean, we've got uh, uh, Wollstonecraft, then there was uh, Virginia Woolf wrote about Orlando, which is about a, a woman going into a man, and that's more like a, a transgender uh, thing as well. But she, the, the, it is a woman who dresses as a man, and it becomes a man. So that, but it's, it's part of the same debate in a way. Uh, mm. And uh, people like Radcliffe Hall, who was writing at this time, I think, was it? And what uh, contribution was made by the uh, role of women? as going into going into the factories going into the farms during the first world war you know like they did in the second world women yeah. also women also went uh, to do men's men's work in quotation marks during this time where when she was like a teenager or growing up so she would have known all about this and maybe you can say something on, mm. on that line which is yeah relates yeah. to the literary and historical context yeah yeah, it's very, it's all, it's very interesting that whole um, tradition with which she was surrounded, um, and it, the the same thing applies to this as to her deep study of um, you know communist texts and then of Catholic ones later. That um, this history was very important both to her and Sylvia. Um, and I think that Sylvia was very aware of women's power. Um, and one of the things you mentioned was women workers during the First World War, because Sylvia was that bit older than Valentine. Sylvia had actually worked in a munitions factory. She volunteered in a munitions factory during, during the First World War when she was 18 or something like that. And she, um, wrote uh, about an article about the, the the bad conditions in which in which these women um, were forced to work. Um, and both of them were they thought that um, Radcliffe Hall and the Well of Loneliness was a little bit funny because Valent because Valentine and Sylvia both um, very happy in their lesbianism. So the, the deep gloom of Radcliffe Hall, um, you know, they found a bit daft, um, but of course they both loved Orlando and um, uh, Sylvia um, knew Virginia Woolf. Um, and it, it was just to, another little loop off when she was, um, she met Virginia Woolf um, at a dinner party not long after she'd written Lolly Willows. And Virginia Woolf said to her, how do you know so much about witchcraft? <laughs> and Sylvia said, because I am one. <laughs> um, and, you know, Virginia was like, woo. <laughs> um, but, um, so yes, the, I think that, I think that, that rather like the, um, the fact that, that those sexologists had, um, studied although of course more male homosexuality but but also um studied studied sexuality that that fascinated them in the same way all kinds of examples of women not only cross-dressing women though of course that was particularly interesting but but couples of women in the past fascinated them so they were mad about the ladies of Langoslin they'd got you know, the, the Hamwood Papers, which came mm. out in 1930-ish, I think, um, was a big source of inspiration to them both. Um, there's also an interesting bit in um, Sylvia's diary where uh, a Dorset neighbour tells them about a Victorian uh, heiress locally who ran away with her maid on her wedding, just before <laughs> the night before her wedding. And the and Sylvia said the person who told her this story used the word eloped, making it very clear that she and the maid were running away together. She wasn't just running away from the wedding and taking her maid with her, and that they'd lived, <laughs> you know, a, a long and happy life together afterwards. And I think that that's interesting too because it shows that people knew that they were interested, um, and you know wanted to tell them good stories that they knew. Um, and they had a they had a wide um, 
lesbian circle as well. They knew a lot of a lot of of and and gay men too. Um, they knew a lot of queer people. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other questions? Actually, when I was wondering about the agriculture workers when she was in Dorset, how did, did she interview people or how did she gather the information? Did she talk to people personally or did she just read newspaper articles? No, no, she was the one writing the newspaper articles, really, I think. Um, mm. she, because, the, because they were doing that, um, they had been doing that that 20s thing of you know going to somewhere that was then unknown in the depths of the country and they they just initially were just renting rooms in cottages mm. um so they got to know all of the people who lived in the village very quickly mm. and valentine drank in the village pub the sailors return mm -hmm. um the pub landlady was was her great friend flory leg and um, so she knew everyone in the village um, mm. very, very well. And um, she, and I think that's really what gave her such a deep personal mm. reaction to it, mm. that these people were her friends. Mm. And then when she went to their house, you know, there was water pouring through the roof and nothing had been done, nothing would be done. So nobody mm. could sleep upstairs. They all had to stay downstairs all the time. Mm. And, um, and you know, the their lives were, were going to be hard. I mean, people accepted that, you know. Mm. Um, the, the, the shepherds in particular, you know, were out in the snow in the middle of the night and all that mm. kind of thing. But what they were appalled by, and again, this links back to the feminism question in particular, was how incredibly difficult it was for the women who mm -hmm. were expected to, you know, maintain a household um, in these appalling conditions. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it wasn't just that money was tight, but that they were absolutely stuck where they were. They couldn't move. Mm. Um, you know, and, and the tide cottages, which which it was the landlords, extremely wealthy landlords, um, business to keep in a decent condition, were you know were like slums, mm. and and you know they were genuinely really shocked by what they saw, and I think that um, the you know the country conditions. Um, was a book that she was felt very passionately about um mm -hmm. and uh it was based on as you say lots of interviews and mm -hmm. lots lots of um of personal experience thank you very much i think that should be a pretty good one to read i would be quite interested to read that to find out because you can see in a way the difference between the men's work and women's work because women were in the house and couldn't really had to do the household men going out somewhere and doing something outside the house is in a way more pleasant than being in a house where the roof is leaking yeah. and things aren't really working very well it's mm. extremely unpleasant you mm. just want to rather get out i can see that one thing that's interesting about that is that, um, as far as I can tell from the records, um, the women actually went and went to the pub in in Cholden, um as oh. much as the men did, which I think is perhaps yeah. not not that usual. Um, but certainly, Granny Moxon, um, Valentine's great friend, um, a woman who was supposed to be a witch, you know, was sometimes carried home from the pub incapably drunk. <laughs> <laughs> that's wonderful that really is very good well thank you very much so um what other um questions are coming up um i'm looking at the time it is 8 15 we do sometimes um well we close at about 8 15 or 8 30 or something depending on um how busy things are but if there's not another question, then I would say um, we come to the end of the meeting. Before we end the meeting, of course, I would just like to say that we are the Socialist History Society and we do 
like you to join us and and have us become a bigger and more uh, a totally active uh, organization we do uh, about monthly meetings well apart from in the summer interesting things um, are coming up later on this year and next year so do stay in touch whoops everything seems to be going okay do stay in touch and uh, thank you ever so much francis for your talk i can hardly see anybody everybody's gone <laughs> thank you very much thank and you. i close thank the meeting you. oh the picture is back that was very strange thank you very much francis thank you thank you, thank you. and good night Good night. Thank you very much. Thank you.